equal to zero. Because this being bigger than or equal to zero means that function is good to go, isn't it? Yes? This is called a quadratic inequality. It's not, an equ it's not a quadratic equation. It's a quadratic inequality. And there's an entire set of steps on how to solve quadratic inequalities. It was something covered in Math 1414 College Algebra. Hopefully, they covered it for you. So I'm not going to take a lot of time to do this. If you don't know how to solve a quadratic inequality, I recommend you use Google and YouTube and go watch some videos on how to solve quadratic inequalities. I am going to do this a little bit. I think I'm going to do, go a little bit easier than, than this method because this is a pretty easy thing to look at. Let me just look at that right there. If I asked you to graph that as a function, what would it look like? What would that look like? Change the order. What would that look like? Parabola opens which way? Down, Down but it's been moved up nine, right? So it would be like this. Do you know where it would hit this, these, the axis? Can you tell just by looking what would make this function zero? No, if I plug in three or negative three. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Okay, so we want to know when this function is bigger than or equal to zero, which would happen between here and here, right? So that means that this thing only makes sense if the x values are between negative 3 and 3. Yes? And I'm only asking you to look between negative 2 and 3, which means that we are good. We are continuous on that closed interval. Yeah? If this said negative 2 to 4, no good. All right? Questions? So I can proceed with the closed interval method? All right. Go ahead, take the derivative. We're going to need the derivative, right? Go ahead and take the derivative. Yes? In the example, let's say it's not continuous, so it doesn't follow the requirements. Uh-huh. You can't do it. So then we just you said, yeah, this, this uh, theorem, closed interval method would not apply. And so would you be giving I wouldn't give you anything like that, yeah. But I do want you to consider it. I'm letting you work through this derivative. What rule are you using there for that derivative? Product, Product rule. And? And a little chain, right? I think by this point everyone should at least have the derivative, like the raw derivative out. You have product rule, derivative of this times this, plus derivative of the root. Derivative root of something is 1 over 2 times that root. Go inside the root times derivative of what's in here, negative 2x. Finish off the product rule times x. Okay, so that's your, that's your product rule. The 2's cancel x squared, and you have a negative, so it changes it to negative x squared over the root. 
Okay, that's just the derivative. Now, what am I supposed to do with this derivative? I need to figure out when the derivative is zero, and I need to figure out when the derivative does not exist. These are two separate ideas that I have to look at. Let's talk about the does not exist. Let's do that one first, because again, I think this one's easier. The only problem you're ever going to have, right? The only problem you're ever going to have with this derivative is where? If, if x is 3. Now, remember, there are some, when we looked at this in the very beginning, we said that there were some domain restrictions, right? Like, you had to be between ne negative 3 and 3. So we're not even considering any, anything outside of that right now. But when you look at this, if we plug in 3 here, won't we get division by 0? Yes, we do get division by zero, and three is in our interval. So we do have a critical number from this that is in our interval. It is the number three. So f prime does not exist at x equals three since we get division by zero. Everyone understand that? It's OK to plug 3 in up here, right? Because we plug in 3 here, we just get 0. But when we plug 3 into the derivative, we get 0 on the bottom, which is division by 0, which is no good. That makes the derivative not exist. OK? All right. What about the derivative being 0? That's going to be a little bit messy, isn't it? Oh, we're just going to go solve this equation. We're going to set this equal to 0. No big deal, right? That's going to look a little intimidating. OK, so before I do this, before I actually set the derivative equal to 0, I want to remind, not remind you, but maybe this might be the first time you ever see this. I'm going to please uh, remind me that we have that critical number. This is a side thought. If a over b equals 0, then a must be 0. All right, this, this holds for anything. All right? Anytime you have a fraction and you set it equal to 0, then the only thing you have to worry about is when the numerator is 0. Why? Yeah, but I'm saying if a fraction is equal to 0, all you have to do is set the numerator equal to 0. Right? That's what this is saying. Hey, say a fraction is 0. Just look at the numerator. Set it equal to 0. Why, though? Yeah, what I could do is take this equation, just multiply both sides by b, right? Mm -hmm. And if I do that, I get a, and then over here is 0. So I can do that for any fraction. So I'm about to use that. I just want to, when I do it, I want to make sure everyone's clear on it. I'm about to get a fraction equal 0, and then I'm going to say, hey, we just look at the numerator and set it equal to 0. Understand? So I'm going to do that. But unfortunately, we don't have a fraction yet. We have two terms, don't we? I'm about to set that equal to 0. So I'm setting root 9 minus x squared minus x squared over root 9 minus x squared, setting it equal to 0. I'm trying to figure out where this happens. So what I'll do first is I do want to get a fraction. I want to get a fraction equals 0. All right, that's what I want to get. So I'm going to put those two together. I'm going to put these two terms together, which means I need a common denominator. OK, I'm going to look at that as, uh, over 1. So what am I going to introduce? Root. So I'm going to just basically multiply this by root 9 minus x squared on top and root 9 minus x squared on the bottom. That's what I'm going to do. Understand? What happens in the numerator of this new fraction over here. The roots are going to go away. You just get 9 minus x squared over root 9 minus x squared minus x squared over root 9 minus x squared equals 0. So now I have the same denominator and now I can put them together. So when I put these together I will get 9 minus x squared minus x squared again all over root 9 minus x squared equals 0. 
Do you have any questions on what I just did? Uh, yeah, I'm going to go one more line. One more line. I'm going to just rewrite. This is 9 minus 2x squared over root 9 minus x squared equals 0. So all I did was combine these two together. You could have done that right off the bat from here, but that's where we're at, right? I have a fraction that is equal to 0 now, don't I? So all I'm going to do from this is set the top equal to 0, set the numerator equal to 0. That's my next line. So this means 9 minus 2x squared equals 0. And this is a little quadratic, right? A little miniature quadratic. I'll move the 2x squared to the other side. I'll divide by 2. And last step is to do what? Take the square root. And when you take the square root, you have to do plus or minus root of 9 halves. I have two answers, don't I? Now I need to figure out whether or not the, these answers live inside this interval or not. Do they live in here or not? So we might need a, cal a calculator for this. Um, what's 9 divided by 2? 4.5? And then take the square root. It's like 2 point something. I think, I think both of these are going to live in there. 2.12? So we're getting, we're getting both positive and negative. This is approximately positive and negative 2.12. Both of those numbers live in our interval, which means we have to check them both. Pardon? It does not. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yes, you're right. This, this negative one, sorry. It's outside. I thought, for some reason, I thought that was negative 3 to 3. Negative 2, this negative one is outside. Right? The negative one is outside. The positive one is good, though. So let me, let me write that down. Let me put this here. So I'm still working here on the step one. Trying to find the critical numbers. So I've got x is equal to 2.12 and x is equal to negative 2.12. I scrap this one because it's not in negative 2, 3, right? Still in step one. What now? I've found the critical numbers. What do I do with them? Plug them into the original function. And I have to plug in all the critical numbers. How many critical numbers did I have? Two. Two, I have. No, it was three, right? Three is what made the derivative undefined. And 2.12 is what makes the derivative zero. Actually, oh, you know what? I'm not going to. Uh, I want to do exact values here. I don't want to do decimals. I'm going to put root 9 halves here. Instead of the appro approximation, I used the approximation just to make sure I knew whether or not I was in the interval. All right, let's plug 3 in to the function. <coughs> you get 0. And what about root 9 halves? So if I put root 9 halves here, I get root 9 halves times root of 9 minus, what happens if I take root 9 halves and square it? I get 9 halves, the root goes away. What's 9 minus 9 halves? 4 you should get 9 halves again. Notice I'm not using decimals. Right? I just got a common denominator here, so it's 18 halves minus 9 halves is 9 halves. And what's root 9 halves times root 9 halves? 9 halves. Okay, so I've got this value, I've got this value. I am done with step one. What is step two? Step two, plug in the endpoints. Okay, we're going to plug the endpoints into the function. So for step two, I need to do f of what? Negative two and f of three. But wait a minute, we already did f of three. Right? 
it turned out that one of our critical numbers was actually an endpoint. So I don't, I don't have to think about the computation again. I know it. It's already zero, right? But f of negative 2, I have to compute. So f of negative 2 is negative 2 root of 9 minus negative 2 squared is 4. So negative 2 root 5. I can box the zero, but I already have zero, don't I? All right, I think we're ready for step three, or, or conclusion. Global max and global minimum, what do we got? So I want you to write it like I, like I said. F of root nine halves is nine halves is our is our global maximum our global minimum is f of negative two which is negative two root five obviously that's a positive number right this is a negative number so this is bigger than this and zero is in there but zero is obviously between those two so that's it let's graph it see what it looks like we are graphing x times, oops, whoa, times uh, square root of 9 minus x squared. And we are graphing this on the interval negative 2 to 3. Yeah, I could change those. What was our biggest? Our biggest value was, I'll go to six. There we go. There we go. Can you all see it okay? So there is the graph of x times the square root of 9 minus x squared, only graphed between negative 2 and 3. And so this is our, this is our global minimum, right? It happens at negative 2, and the value is negative 2 root 5, whatever that is. And then our, our global maximum was happening at 2.12 or something like that, 2.12. So here's 2.1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is 2.12, it's about right in here, right about there. Do we look good? Look like we got it. And that y value is, well, here's 4, here's 5. It looks about 4.5, 9 halves. All right, so so far the math looks like it's uh, matching up with what we're seeing, right? I think now would be a good time, because we, we, uh, we have time, um, to talk about, like introduce you to a word problem. There's no, there's no such thing as, as getting a word problem too soon, all right? Yeah. Okay. So let's say that we want, to, we want to do the following. We want to take, you may have seen this before in a college algebra class or something. Let's say we have a sheet of aluminum or something, some sort of metal. And we are going to um, take this sheet and we are going to cut out the edges, cut out the corners. So I'm going to cut out Cut out, cut out, cut out. Someone give me a sacrificial piece of paper, please. Actually, I need like two or three sacrificial pieces of paper. Not all of them. 
Sure you don't need that? Oh, oh wow, okay. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna cut out this corner like this. Cut out this corner. How many of you have seen this? Okay, so if, just, just a few of you, all right, good. So I'm gonna cut out the corner like this. You've seen me do it? This is like a classic problem for Cal 1. All right, so I've got this sheet right, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fold up the edges. this and Jason is going to weld these edges together for us. Can you do that for me? Paper welding? Paper welding, yeah, yes. Welding, yeah. Okay. So again, if we had if we had some metal, right, we could we could somehow cut out the corners maybe with a torch or something and then fold up the corners and we would form this this um, container, right? A tray. And this container would have a volume to it, right? An amount of liquid that we could pour into this. Okay. And then you get someone else who decides that instead of cutting out the corners to be this big, they're going to go a little bit bigger with their corners. So what's going to be the big difference here between this, this one and the one that's already made? It's going to be taller, but it's not going to be as wide, right? Is this entertaining? So we're going to do some origami here. All right, so we have two containers made uh, doing the same process, but different, different cuts out of these corners, right? They both have a volume to them. Yes? yes. Here's my question. Do they have the same volume? What do you think? Let's take a vote. How many of you think that these have the same volume? You okay? Do these have the same volume? They do? No? Let's take a vote. I want to see how many of you think that these have the exact same volume. Okay? How many of you think that they are different volumes? Come on, go with it. Go with what you feel. <laughs> you think they're different volumes. Okay? Um, those of you who thought that these are the same, you, are you saying that it wouldn't matter how I cut the corners out? Like if I go even smaller corners, I'm going to still have the same volume? Because it'll be wider, longer, and, but just not as deep. Okay, so there's an easy way to resolve this. Let's resolve this right now. Let's figure out if these have the same volume or not. And the way we can do that is we can just take a specific example. Let's say that this was uh, 30 inches long this way, and let's say it was 20 inches long this way, even though we know that that's 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. All right, so let's say we cut out, let's say we cut out two inch corners. Okay, two inch, two inch, on all these are two inch, two inch, whatever, you get it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, when we, when we fold it up and we make this container, it's going to look like this. Right? That's what it's going to look like. How, how long is this side of the container, which corresponds to this one? 16, 16 inches, how are you getting that? Yeah, so you cut this off, cut this off, you fold it up. So this is really the actual width of this, right? So that was what? 16. Okay, now how long is this container? 26, because again, you cut off 2 and 2 from 30, so you get 26 that way. And how tall is this container? 2 inches. So what is the volume of that container? Someone do that. 16 times 26 times 2. What is it? 832. 832 cubic inches. So I'm going to put inches cubed, right? That's our volume. Now, let's do it a different way. Instead of doing two, what do you want to cut? Five. five? Okay, let's go with five. So let's change these to fives. We change that to five, 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 five. Then our picture is going to change. How wide is it? 
You're only 10 inches wide, right? Because you cut off five from each one. How long is it? 20, but you've got depth here. Maybe I should have drawn this a little bit deeper, like this. There we go. There we go. So now that's five, right? What's the volume of this? A thousand? Cubic inches. They are not the same. Right? So which one should we do? If we, if we're, let's say we're manufacturing some of these trays and we want to be able to create the most volume out of the tray, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say that's our goal. Then we would prefer to do this one, right? We would get more volume. But is that the most volume we could possibly get? Is there a better cut? So we first have to convince ourselves that the cut matters. Have I convinced you that the cut matters? Yes. Okay. Now, the question is, can you find the optimum cut? Yes. Okay, so how? Local minimum, local maximum. Okay, how? The yes, you're right. You show me. Okay, okay. All right, so let's, what we're going to do is we're going to look at it more abstractly, and we are not going to define what the cut is. We're going to leave it as a variable. So we're going to leave this cut as x inches in x inches, right? If we do that, then let's talk about what these sides would be. If that's x, how long is this side then? It was, it was 20, right? And we took away what? An x and an x. So that would be 20 minus 2x. And how long would this be? 30, but we took x off each corner, so 30 minus 2x. How tall would this be? X. Yes? What's the volume of this thing? How many times what times what? Height. 20 minus 2x times 30 minus 2x times x. That is a polynomial function in x, isn't it? Now, do we have a domain restriction? Yes. Yes? Can, if we expand this out, let's expand it now. Let's do this, 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 this. Volume is equal to, let's see, 600 minus 40x minus 60x plus 4x squared. And then I still have to multiply through by an x. Y'all know I'm just expanding this out, right? Okay, so this is now volume, watch me do this. Volume is now a function of x. I'm just stating the fact that the volume depends on only one variable x. So this is kind of like f of x. Equals, and let's, exp let's put things together and let's put it in descending order. So I'm gonna have 4x cubed, and then negative 100x squared, and then finally plus 600x. That is my polynomial function that describes the volume of that container if I cut it exactly x by x squares out of the corners. That should have some sort of max and min on it. What we're interested in is figuring out where this would have a maximum, right? I want the maximum volume. Where do I cut to get maximum volume? But I need to talk about domain restrictions. So is there a restriction on this cut? Yeah, so you think of it physically, if this was 20 wide, 20 wide and 30 tall, and I go to take this first corner out, you know, I could, I could go like, you know, four inches, but I couldn't go past 10, because then I'd be on the other side. So 10 would be the most I could do, and if I did that, I would have a ridiculous object anyway. It would have no, it would have no width to it at all. So 10 would be the absolute maximum I could go and it's going to give me a ridiculous answer. Zero volume. Make sense? Okay, but it gives me a restriction. So if I do this on the interval, you said 10 is the most I can go. What's the smallest I can go? Zero. Zero. Which means you're not going to make a container. You'll have a flat piece of you'll, you'll have flat. It's just you're going to leave your sheet exactly the way it is with no volume. But it, but it is a restriction, isn't it? 
we are going to try and find the maximum of this function on this closed interval. Okay, take out a separate sheet of paper. Take a separate sheet of paper and put your name on it. And I want you to work this problem out. And I don't mind if you work together, but you're going to turn it in today in 12 minutes. <laughs> For what? Just to graph it and find the maximum? Yeah, no. Nope. Yeah, the calculator can tell us where the maximum is. The calculus won't. Mm -hmm. Yep. The problem with the calculator is this. I could come up with a problem where the calculator is going to, the, you're not going to be able to depend on the graph or maybe make it where you won't even be able to see where the function is. It doesn't appear. So do the calculus, trust the calculus, work it out. You gotta have Ghanas. Gotta go with it. <laughs> um, I need to tell you what uh, what I actually want to know. Find the maximum volume. That's what I want at the end of the day. I want you to tell me the maximum volume. Yep, for this particular situation, tell me what the maximum volume you can get out of that is. Yep, this is the volume function. Okay. You're trying to find the maximum of this on a closed interval. Right? Okay. This, is a, this, is a this is a continuous function on a closed interval. Just do what we just did in the previous two problems. Do that three-step process. If you have a question,